system as well as cardiac resynchronization therapy. Over the course of his career, he has been actively involved in the training of doctors in the field of internal medicine and cardiology in national and regional level. In, the, in pursuit of his excellence, he has also participated in many international multi-centers in trial as investigator, as well as being part of writing committee and a review of national guideline, registry and advisory board. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Dr. Gary. Thank, thank you, Cindy. I, no I feel problem. humble and uh, with your kind introduction. <laughs> and uh, thanks a lot to the IMU alumni and also Dr. Sandeep uh, for this kind invitation. It feels nice to be back uh, in IMU virtually. I think the last time I've been back to IMU Bukit Jalil campus was almost like probably 2015 or 2014. Probably around that point of time, and uh, yeah. I think things must have changed a lot yes, since then. Yes, I think I think you <laughs> need to visit us one of these days. <laughs> Hopefully, once the pandemic is over and yes, we can get physical yes. things running, then we'll probably be able to do that. Uh. Yes, All right. yes. So I actually been uh, asked to give a talk, and I was thinking, you know, what talk should I be talking about? And uh, probably then I suddenly it sort of uh, pop into my mind that I probably want to talk about ECGs, something that you know I'm very keen of, and uh, something that. Mm, uh, mm very close to my practice as well. So, so that's why you are here together with me to unlock the mystery of heart rhythm today. All right, yes. let's, let's move on. A lot of people, you know, tends to ask me, you know, hey, what does an electrophysiologist do? You know, uh, are you a heart doctor or are you not? So I always tell them I wear two caps, you know. The first cap will always be a plumber. So I do deal with coronary issues. You know, you have a heart attack, we open up vessels and things like that put in standings and balloons. But the other caps I actually do uh, wear is actually a cap of an electrician, whereby you see me fixing the uh, electrical system of the heart itself. Whereby as most of you, you know, uh, who are medical students or even practicing doctor, you definitely recognize the SA node, the AV node and everything. So anything that goes wrong with it, I also fix the electrical system. So I'm like a handyman now, let's say, where I fix the plumbing and also the electrical system of the house, which is very close to our chest, AKA the heart itself. So sometimes, you know, when people have abnormal heart rhythm, they can have slow heart rhythm like this, whereby you find that the heart rhythm is so slow. And this is definitely a case of people who had a severe high degree AV block. So therefore we put in a pacemaker. So we do a bit of uh, things, electrophysiology do a bit of things like a surgeon. We do a bit of operating work, you know, where we open up, make incision, and then open up pockets, you know, the good old things that we used to do as a surgical house officer back then as well. You know, of course, eventually, you know, uh, we fix in the leads the artificially. And of course, as you can see here, there's a pacemaker sitting in the pocket right at the pectoral region itself. Ultimately, when the patient loses the heart function electrically, we give them back a heart here, an artificial heart shape here. But uh, that's basically a part of our, uh, what electrophysiologist does. Well, then to move on to that set of the platform of uh, my introduction of myself, uh, then to sort of lay a bit of platform, what we're going to do today uh, in the next one hour or so, it's actually to look into ECGs. So talking about ECG for the next one hour, it's a bit difficult because ECG is such a vast and wide topic. So therefore, I know I thought we'll probably go through some basics and then we're going to go through some six case-based discussion. So sort of uh, exemplify to you, you know, some of the practices that you, uh, cases that you may come across as um, medical students in a ward or even as a doc practicing doctor in your clinics or even in your own centers. And of course, the take-home messages. So feel free to, you know, to anytime uh, stop me or want to ask any burning questions. If not, we can always answer the questions to the very last, uh, the very end of the session. So people used to say, you know, the one who holds key can unlock one's heart. I always say that, you know, the one who knows ECG can unlock anyone's heart. And it is very true. In fact, if you were to have a patient, you know, and to just do an ECG, you can probably know a bit more of their conditions. For instance, if a patient comes to you with a fever, you know, uh, and of course, uh, having ongoing fever, like viral fever or dengue fever, you put an ECG, definitely more or less, you'll see a sinus tachycardia. If a patient comes to you, you know, with giddiness and you do an ECG, you see that they're having bradycardia, like AV block, you probably that strikes a diagnosis. So always think that as a doctor, it doesn't matter whether you are cardio or non-cardio related. Sometimes knowing ECGs may help you to help your patients in many ways. Uh, you may not be able to treat them adequately, but you may refer to your colleagues who may be able to help them in that context as well. 
So with that, the first thing about ECG is always about the ECG lead placements. As we have learned from medical schools and as we were at the bottom of the food chain back then as a house officer, you know, where we have to get uh, doing the ECGs or the set lines and we get the vessel, vessel fixed in. We also learn to place the ECGs along the way and it's always very common general knowledge that the V1, V2 has to be the fourth intercostal space at the parasternal region. Then eventually you put the V4 at the mid-clavicular and then V5 and of course the V6 is where you put at the mid-axillary line itself. Now, of course V3 is somewhere between V2 and V4. So this is no-brainer to many of us who have been practicing in a hospital setting or even in a primary care setting as well. And of course, along the way, we also have to remember their limb leads and the augmented leads as well. But there are times we actually need to uh, change a bit of the lead placements and they are, you, may be, you may not be surprised where sometimes you hear our emergency physicians or our cardiologist colleague actually decided to do a posterior lead. So what does it mean? It's basically putting the anterior leads, you know, and make it V7, V8 and V9. You still have 12 leads ECG only, but it's just that you utilize, you know, either the V4, V5, V6 to put it as V7, V8, and V9 to look at the posterior part of the heart. Because sometimes when you have someone with a RCA, right coronary artery infarction, you have to look for a posterior MI, which sometimes can only be picked up when you do a V7, V8, and V9 because they have ST elevation in that. Of course, the uh, clue will be uh, ST depression in V1, V2, and V3, which is directly the opposites of V7, V8, and V9. Sometimes you have patients with dextrocardia, so instead of putting on the left side, which you probably won't see anything much, you instead you have to put on the right-hand side itself. So there's always a bit of variation. And sometimes you will hear some electrophysiologists, you know, likes to do this, whereby, you know, we have these leads that is V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. There are times we actually put it at a high precordial lead. So what does it mean? Basically means the V1 and V2, instead of the fourth intercostal space, we actually put it at the second intercostal space here. Well, the reason is the only time we would like to do this high precordial lead ECG lead placement is when we suspect a patient having Brugada syndrome. I'm sure many of you have heard of Brugada before. Many of you have heard of sudden cardiac death in young patients before. This is an ECG, you know, which looks very sub, uh, suspicious of Brugada. Brugada basically have ST elevation B1, B2, and B3. And the special thing about this ST elevation is that it actually picks up and come down with a slope like this. But this ECG was very doubtful, you know. It doesn't look like it. It looks like it. So sometimes when we just shift the ECG leads from V1, V2 at the fourth to the second intercostal space, you may actually review the true picture of a Brugada syndrome like this. There, this is the typical Brugada ECG changes. This is what we call the coved ST elevation. And then you will strike your diagnosis why your patient is having fainting spells because this patient had Brugada syndrome with paroxysmal VT or VF. So definitely the patients need an ICD to prevent sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> so this is just to sort of lay down the rules of, you know, basic ECG placement. And I always make it a very important practice rule to be very nice to my nurses and my house officer back then because they are the ones who are going to do the ECG for me. So I need to make sure that they do good ECG tracing without hanky-panky on the way through. And of course, we do know there's many segments in an ECG tracing. We have learned about PR segment, we have learned about PR interval, ST segment, QT interval. But what is very important sometimes, we also look for TP segments, especially in pericarditis. And of course, sometimes RP segments is also very important, especially for uh, cardiac electrophysiology when we look at SVT. Because in SVT, it's a broad group. In SVT, you can have atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia. But you know, the uh, EP guys, the rhythm boys and girls, you know, they like to think of something else, they always have this long RP or short RP tachycardia. But again, do not worry about that. That is something beyond the scope of today's discussion. Well, let's move on to the case number one uh, so that we'll be able to finish in time and Cindy won't be very upset because I have run over the time. So case number one here, I have this patient, you know, that should I be worried or I should really just chill out? So this is a 30 years old gentleman, pre-morbid new, and then, of course, have family history of IHD, slightly overweight, but health screening, you know, everything was normal, you know, and of course, referred because of an abnormal ECG. Requested for an urgent review. 
by the referring doctor because of the ECG changes here. Have a look at this ECG now. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to get polling from you all, but you know, I will be very glad, you know, if you all can put in the chat group or in the chat box there, what's your answer to be, uh, to just sort of give me a feedback that everyone is listening to me and not dozing off after hyperglycemic post-lunch uh, sleeping. Eh? So have a look at this ECG over here. What do you think of this ECG? If I look at this ECG over here, definitely, you know, you look like uh, an ECG which has actually a sinus rhythm. But what is really staring at you, you know, is something that is looking at the ST segment and of course the T wave inversion, uh, the T wave itself. So of course, this was a repeated ECG, slightly clearer, but again, something that looks very glaring to you over here. So my questions over here to the one who is still listening to me, what do you think is the ECG showing? Is it A, B, C, or D? I'll be very glad, you know, to give about 10 to 20 seconds to see the response from the floor. What do you think is this condition about? Patients, it's fairly asymptomatic. Uh, come just for screening with the primary care physician. And of course, then realize the ECG looks a bit weird. So therefore, decided uh, to refer to me because a bit worrying. So I'm getting some B and something, some C's over here. Good. <clears throat> All right, that's a very good response. Okay, then let us move on and see what is actually this ECG is about. Actually, if you look at this, those I've chosen C, you're not far off. This is really what we call a normal variant. And this is what we usually term as benign early repolarization. If you look back at the ECGs now, there's actually, which I'm going to bring it back to you over here, you can see that there is actually a very obvious ST elevation here, all right? But the ST elevation is a one which is concave, and it doesn't just limit itself to the anterior, which is the LAD territory from V1 to V6. You can even see in lead two, a bit in lead one, AVL is a bit maybe far off, but AVM you definitely can see it very clearly. And if you have a close look, you know, at the ECGs over here, you do find that at the end of the day over here. This V5 or V4 itself, if I can just zoom it in for you over here, you find that there's actually a tiny bump here. A tiny bump after the R wave coming down, then there's another bump before it sits down into the baseline. This is what we call the fish hook uh, pattern itself. So this one, looking at this, you know, patients have no symptoms, you know, at the same time, patients, you know, having these changes itself. It tells me this is actually a benign early repolarization. This is a notch that we see. We call it the fish hook itself. And this is the one which we saw in our patients. And often than not, the ST elevation is less than one quarter of the T wave itself. The same as our patient happens in many younger cohort of patients. So if it's really pericarditis, usually patient would have some uh, pericardial pain, pericarditic type of pain. So in this condition, patient doesn't really have that type of pruritic pain at all. So making this uh, likelihood to be a benign early repolarization. So other pointers for benign early repolarization is there is no reciprocal changes. Meaning to say that if you have ST elevation because of MI in the anterior leads, you will see ST depression in the inferior lead. Likewise, if you have an inferior lead ST elevation, you will see an ST depression in the anterior lead. So if there's no reciprocal, then another pointers towards benign early repolarization. And of course, you will see the T wave prominent and asymmetrical. Often than not, if you are a bit puzzled, is this really MI or not? Ask the patient to run a bit, then do back the ECG. Because when you see a so-called ST elevation during this benign early repolarization, now when I ask the patient to run, the heart rate goes up, the BER, the ST elevation disappears. If it's an MI, it probably wasn't and patient get a pain and collapse down. But because it's a B9 early repolarization, the ST elevation disappeared. So this one, it tells me this is a B9 early repolarization. I will definitely chill out in this case over here and not become too worried. But nevertheless, the first pointer is, the key home message here is, if you have ST elevation in doubt, treat it as MI until proven otherwise. All right. So hopefully that will give you a bit of idea what do you think of this subsequent two ECGs? Do you think really it's a benign early reprisation or not? 
Well, I'm just going to zoom in to you again over here. If you see, it is not concave like what we see just now in a benign early run, but it's rather slanted up. It looks a bit, you know, uh, curved. It looks a bit slanting up. When you have something like this, which is not very clear cut concave, it looks a bit uh, like that. <clears throat> you may have a doubt, but it can be turned out to be a B art as well. Because why? Again, if I look at here, I don't see any reciprocal changes. I don't see SC elevation elsewhere. So it tells me this is likely benign early reposition. But again, if you're in doubt, always do a serial ECG and repeat. But this is a bit different from an ECG, which I'm going to show you over here. All right. This is again very normal looking fine. But if I'm going to show to you this uh, so called ECG over here, you will realize here is actually a bit concave looking here. All right. Therefore, when you have a sad face, a frowning face like this, the ST elevation looks, looks like this, always think that this is a ST elevation until proven otherwise. Likewise, if you have something that looks like this, and then you know it looks so high, like a tombstone looking like this, always think this is an ST elevation because of an MI until proven otherwise. So hopefully I will not confuse you, you know, to make you think ST elevation is benign. There are some ST elevation which is actually very dangerous, which is like an MI. But sometimes when you get ST elevation which looks uh, fairly what we call benign looking, with no ST elevation change, uh, with no ST depression changes, you do the uh, walk test or you do the running test and the ST elevation disappears, you may be just dealing with benign early reposition in that context over here. All right. So hopefully that will give you a bit of a clearer idea about what we're dealing with. All right. Now, let's move on to case number two over here. We basically have this uh, case, which is, is it an abnormally or normally fast uh, condition? So this, again, is a very young gentleman, 23 years old, uh, history of syncope a few years ago, transient with preceding palpitation, otherwise no recurrence. And well, with no complaints. Came for an EP review for a query arrhythmia over here. And let's have a look at this ECG of this patient over here. So this ECG was initially done in the initial hospital a few years ago. So it actually came over to me for, to seek a second opinion. Definitely, you do see something that is very uh, obvious over here. If you just have pay attention to the R interval, that looks very fast looking over here. Probably about 100 bits per minute as compared to the sinus one, which is actually a bit slower, which is looking at about 50 to 60 bits per minute over here. Now, the patient were also had put on a holder in the initial hospital, whereby you see these ECGs uh, with a holder monitoring, and again, showing what they label as so-called SVT. So looking at the initial shot of the ECG, looking at the holder, the treating physician thinks that, hey, this patient has an SVT. So SVT can mean any other thing, right? So my question to you over here, as I would very value your input as well, do you think it's really an SVT? Is it really a sinus rhythm? Is this a sinus arrhythmia? Or is this an artifact from the ECG lead? Let's have your thought about this in the next 10 seconds. So I can see Samantha choosing it as C, sinus arrhythmia. Anyone else, any other thoughts? Look at the ECGs back again. Something that's staring at you. <clears throat> All right. There are a few more choosing C as well. Okay, great. Well, let's move on. Is this really a rhythmia or is this an SVT here? Since most have chosen this to be a, a rhythmia itself. All right. Well, if you have a look closely over here, I did a holder for him and I find exactly the same thing. Sometimes intermittently, he goes into these so-called faster runs of heart rate. And then at times, he goes back slowly again. And throughout the whole 24 hours, he has recurrence episode of this. Yet, he has no symptoms at all. All right? And if you look again at this lead itself, I'm just going to zoom in over here for you to see. You look at the so-called when it's sinus rhythm at time, that P wave at here, and the P wave at here. And now, you look at the P wave during the so-called fast rhythm over here. You realize that, that the P wave over here at this point of time is exactly the same P wave as the previous P wave during the so-called sinus rhythm. 
So it means to say that the sinus, the P over here and the P over here is exactly the same. If it's really an SVT, number one, you probably won't be able to see in this context of today's talk, you probably won't be able to see a P wave preceding the QRS so nicely. Even if it's really an atrial tachycardia, you should see a different type of P wave over here. So ultimately, when we see a P wave that looks very similar to the sinus P, and it's appearing to him in 24 hours on and off like this, plus he has no symptoms, we are really dealing with what we call sinus arrhythmia. He has what we call a phasic sinus arrhythmia, whereby you see that there's a pattern one. It will be normal, red bit, and then slightly go faster, and then slow down again. So repeatedly, you will see it because of respiration. Yeah, sometimes people have non-phasic sinus arrhythmia whereby the intervals of the P or the R intervals varies with no particular pattern. It just comes faster, then after that, normalize. Come faster and then normalize. As opposed to a phasic one where you see a normal heartbeat and then slowly go fast and then slowly slow down again. So these are the usual symptoms that we see in that context. All right, And the mechanism of a sinus arrhythmia, I'm not going to go through with you, but it plays a very important role because of our respiratory centers and our uh, what we call our brainstem centers, which actually plays a role because it innovates the SA nodes itself. So it will actually interplay and causes variation of our normal sinus rhythm, causing sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia is benign. The prognosis is good. Don't have to worry about that. Patient doesn't need any treatment at all. All right. So with that, we're going to move on to the third case itself, which is blackout again and again. So this case was very interesting when it first referred to me because what happened to this lady was uh, she was a very unfortunate lady because she just had uh, uh, this uh, uh, vaginal delivery a few days ago before uh, incidences of collapsing and having syncope. So, but you can see from her pre-morbid, she had multiple comorbidities. She had a cholecystectomy. She had, sorry, she has a lab cystectomy because of ovarian cysts. She had a PDA closure. She had a pyelonephritis issue. And of course, to top it up, she had benign breast lump by itself. So what happened to her at day three? You know, she actually came with episiotomy wound breakdown, come with fever, treated as postpartum pyrexia, and of course, having pyelonephritis once again. The problem with during this admission, she referred to the cardio side was because she had repeated episodes of collapse, you know, with documented VF with defibrillation uh, need to be given in the ward by itself. So this is something that is very, very worrying by itself. Uh, therefore, you know, the thing is when initially the uh, initial treating doctor actually decided to do an echo for this patient uh, because at the end of the day, they are a bit worried, is this patient having an ischemic heart disease? Uh, or is the patient having a, any form of structural heart disease causing her to collapse and getting VTVF? Uh, therefore, in the context, they are a bit worried. That's why they did an echo stat. And in fact, echo was not surprising. EF was intact, no structural abnormality. Therefore, but the only problem is she had a low potassium of 2.4. So this 2.4 potassium was so low that causes uh, patient to have VTVF or is it not just really potassium issue itself? This is what we're going to deal with. Because at the end of the day, when they corrected the potassium, they realized that the patients, even with the potassium normalized, the patient's still getting VTVF episode in that context. So it means whatever that you can reverse, you have treated the pyrexia, you have treated the hypokalemia, yet patients still get a VTVF, it means it must be a cardiac-related cause causing a ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So what is it that in a young patient can collapse ca causing VT and VF despite all reversible causes has been uh, remedied? So let's look at the ECG presentation over here. And I will really want you to have a close look at this ECG because my next question is going to be asking you what is wrong with this ECG over here. What do you think this ECG is showing to you at the end of the day. And this ECG will be the key to answering why the patient had VTVF in the ward. So, do you think the ECG is showing pre-excitation? Do you think it's an evolving MI changes? Do you think it's a prolonged QT? Or 
do you think that you know it is just a normal ECG just having baseline artifact? Let's have a thought. What do you think over here? So I'm going to bring back the old ECG for you to have a look. All right. Have a close look at this ECG. What do you think is really staring at you over here? And give your thought over here. Do you think it's pre-excitation? Long QT or normal ECG? So of course, uh, judging from what I say just now, it can't be long, normal ECG, right? Because it's the key to the answer. Okay, someone actually mentioned long QT over here. Let's have a look. You're very right. If you look at this, just have a, you don't even have to calculate. Sometimes you just have to measure from the one R to the next R over here. You realize that this is the heart rate, the R interval. When your QT interval is 50% or more of the R interval, you're very likely dealing with a long QT. Then you take out your caliper, you take out your apps from your smartphone, you calculate it, and true enough, you may find that it's actually 500 milliseconds, close to 500. So this lady actually had a long QT syndrome. But what happened to her doesn't stop there. You know, you have an answer, but unfortunately, she started developing something like this in the world. All right? She started having this weird, bizarre-looking PVC over here. And this PVC is happening so frequently. It's like every other bit, you're getting this PVC. This is a fusion bit. means a bit between a PVC and also a sinus itself. But you can see that she really had a lot of PVCs coming. And this PVC is what we always classically describe as R on T phenomenon. Remember, you have a PVC with the R wave of the PVC sitting near to the T. You are actually hitting the heart, the myocardium at a very vulnerable phase, causing patient to have VT and VF by itself. So this is what really happens to her. She had a lot of PVCs causing her to go into VT, VF on top of her long QT syndrome. So when the physician who saw first treated this patient realized, oh, this patient had a long QT, had a PVC. Hmm, now mind, I'm going to treat this patient. I'm going to prevent the R on T phenomenon because I don't want the PVC to happen. So something was given to this patient and look at, yes, the PVC disappears. But what worsens is the QT syndrome. Becomes 600 milliseconds. This is way far prolonged. So this is very dangerous because when you prolong the QT interval to even longer period, you actually extend the vulnerability period of the myocardium in a patient with long QT syndrome. So what do you think was given to this patient? Let's have your thoughts. Do you think beta blocker was given to the patient? Do you think patient had amodaron given, flaconite or calcium channel blocker? Let's have your thought over here. So since it's virtual, so don't feel shy about answering because I probably won't be able to know who you are as well. <laughs> so there are some answers, C, flaconite. There are some answers, amodaron. All right, that's very good. All right, I think most of you answer amodaron. Yes, very important to remember. Yes, amodaron is a very, very good drug to use for arrhythmia. But unfortunately, in a long QT syndrome, it's a no-no because amodaron prolongs QT. It's going to worsen the patient's chances of getting VTVF. That's the last thing you ever want to do. So what can we do? Amodaron, once given, last 14 days in your body. Are you going to wait 14 days and sit in front of a patient for the next 14 days times 24 hours, making sure that patient doesn't go into problem? No, we do not do that. At the end of the day, when we realize that this patient had this kind of issues with a prolonged QT plus iatrogenically causing even more prolonged QT uh, because of amodaron admi uh, administration, the only thing you can do is actually what we did was instead, before we do anything, the patient should be TDF had to be shocked. But what was necessary for this patient was for this patient to be paced at a faster rate. You'll be wondering, why am I pacing a patient who had a normal SA node, normal AV node? Because when I pace the patient faster, all right, I actually shorten the QT interval. It is a common knowledge that when your heart rate is slower, your QT prolongs. When your heart rate is faster, the QT shortens. So now what I'm doing is I'm pacing the heart faster, sort of artificially creating a short QT. 
so-called reducing the vulnerability of this patient going to VTVF again. So that's what we do. So we're going to continue to put a patient with TPM, PACE, and eventually this patient definitely need a ICD for sudden cardiac death prevention. So hopefully with that, you know, you will start to become be a bit more alert when an ECG looks very normal to you. Always look at the QT interval because at the end of the day, if you do not think of it, you will not see it at all. All right. And of course, nowadays, you know, we don't really have to remember the formula anymore. With smartphone, with the apps over there, you definitely be able to uh, so-called get the QT corrected based on the heart rate by itself. So it's also very important that, you know, once you have diagnosed someone with long QT syndrome, we use this SWAT score as one of our diagnostic uh, criteria, whereby you have a score of 3.5 and above, not just only looking at QT intervals itself, then we make that diagnosis with long QT because that long QT syndrome, that diagnosis carries with them for the rest of their life. So it is never, never too careful before you diagnose someone with long QT to actually make sure that they fulfill the scoring system before you put them as a labeling as long QT syndrome. So sometimes in dump, uh, feel free to refer to the electrocardio, uh, the cardio, uh, cardiac electrophysiologist for them to make the diagnosis if you are in any slightest doubt in that context. But again, long QT syndrome, although it is not very frequent, it is not rare either, always important to make sure there's a reversible causes. Once you reverse it, yet it still persists on, that's the time you probably want to get your cardiac EP colleagues to actually look at this case itself. So with that, you know, I sort of just want to show to you this one last slide for the long QT. You remember I was showing to you over here, one of the criteria here is the T-wave alternance. What does T-wave alternance mean? It actually basically tells us sometimes the T-wave amplitude is lesser, sometimes it's a deeper amplitude. So you may have a T-wave that is up positive and it becomes even higher the next bit. Or you can have a T-wave that's actually inverted, but it becomes even more inverted. So you see uh, changes in the amplitude of the T-wave. That's what we call T-wave alternate. Sometimes it can help in making a diagnosis together with long QT and a long QT syndrome patient. All right, uh, pointers to take home as well. Long QT syndrome, one in 2000. Sudden cardiac risk is low, but if patient survive a cardiac arrest before the risk of another SCD or a sudden cardiac event can be almost up to 15%, that's a time you really need to consider putting in on an ICD to prevent sudden death in a very young patient over here. There's no other ways around except for ICD. Sometimes we do give beta blockers, but uh, it may not work as well, especially when patients have survived a cardiac arrest. So ICD is the answer. Now, case number four, is it physiological or is it pathological? So I got this case at 18 years old, primary gravida. Yes, it's a very young mother at 35 weeks who presented due to palpitation with no prior episodes and intermittent uh, had this out palpitation. So it comes uh, episodically with no other associated symptoms over here. Boking heart rate was normal. Her thyroid function is normal. Her hemoglobin is also normal. So you sort of take away the possibility of why she's having palpitation. But when she first presented, this is her ECG. I have a close look at this ECG because I'm going to again once ask my dear audience here today, what do you think this ECG is about? Is this physiological or is this pathological over here? So the dilemma here is this, you know, I have a very young patient, all right, structurally normal heart, yet coming with palpitation episodically and the ECG is showing a narrow complex QRS, heart rate is about 140 beats per minute, which is still within her maximal heart rate, normal axis. You know, what is running through my mind of this ECG? Let's have your vote. Do you think this is sinus tachycardia? Do you think this is SVT? Or do you think this is VT? So A, B, and C. What's your thought over here? All right. So most of you thinking this is A, sinus tachycardia. There are some who choose actually SVT. Let's dwell with it. Is this really true or not? A lot of times, you know, uh, when, it, when it comes to maternal case, people always like to say this is maternal tachycardia. 
physiological, it is okay, send them back home, but the patient really complains of symptoms itself. This is a time where you should really look very closely at the ECGs. Let's look at the ECG over here. Very narrow, complex looking QRS. Fine, that's very good. But let's zoom in a bit over here. In lead two, whenever the P wave appears, a P wave is a depolarization wave. So it must be pointy. Whereas the T wave is a repolarization phase. So it tends to be a bit roundish. But you realize here between the one R to the next R over here, the P wave is actually before the T. So when the P happens before the T, except with one exception, most of the time it has to be SVT until proven otherwise. There's one exception which I would not want to tell over here, not so that not to confuse you all, but sometimes we do get the P hiding before the T wave. But in most contexts, when your P appears before the T, then this is likely to be SVT in 99% of the time. So that's why it's very important when you have a narrow complex tachycardia, look at the relation between the P and the QRS, the P and the T itself. Then you probably answer your question, this is not a sinus tachycardia at all. This is a case where she's having an atrial tachycardia. So if you have a Charlie ECG, you follow it through, you'll find that there's actually a T wave hiding inside here. You see the P wave here? You see there's a P wave here? You see there's a P wave here? And it's actually sitting before the T wave. So this is really a case of atrial tachycardia in a maternal case itself. This is another ECG repeated for her, very clearly looking at here. You see the P and the T is very separated. So the P is here, the T is here. So in that context, when the P come before the T, something is very wrong. This is SVT in 99% of the case. So what was done for this patient? We given adenosine. Sometimes adenosine does terminate a focal atrial tachycardia. And true enough, after the second dose of adenosine, the atrial tachycardia terminates and she goes back into sinus rhythm. If it's a sinus tachycardia, you won't get an abrupt termination like this. Only in an SVT, in this context, an atrial tachycardia, when you give adenosine, you stop the tachycardia abruptly. So this is the second reinforcement pointer to me that this is not a sinus tachycardia. All right, And often than not, sometimes atrial tachycardia arises from the atrium. It can be just one point, we call it focal, or it can be a micro re-entry mechanism. Again, don't worry about the mechanism, uh, but it's just to give you a bit of idea of how the electrophysiologists go and play it. Sometimes we just have to put in a catheter, burn away the abnormal spot, patient is cured for life. So because she had recurrence again in the ward after the adenosine, so we decided, you know, we put her on flaconite, one of the anti arrhythmic Therefore, within one day, she goes into sinus rhythm, no more recurrence. She safely go on and delivered her baby well enough without needing to go for any ablation during pregnancy. But of course, postpartum, we bring her back. We go in for an electrophysiology study and we go for a radio frequency ablation to ablate away the one tiny spot in her atrium that gives rise to her atrial tachycardia. Because she's young, she's definitely not going to be going on with flaconet for the rest of her life. She wants to be pregnant again. So definitely we need to sort out her atrial tachycardia before she goes for her second pregnancy. All right, with that, let's look to the second last case over here, case number five, looming storm. So 40 years old gentleman, pre-morbid new, presented with chest pain, had a prior episode of chest heaviness. So chest pain is a very typical description of our cases that we always see. All right, vital sign stable, troponin T is not raised. All right, let's look at this ECG here. Tell me what do you think of this ECG now over here? This ECG is very, very abnormal. All right, that's fine. But when you look at this ECG over here, you see something that's very glaringly looking at you. What do you think is this ECG? Is this an ischemic changes? Is this hypokalemic changes? And remember just I was saying T wave is repolarization period. So is this a repolarization abnormality or is none of the above? So A, B, C, and D. Let's have your thought. Wow, someone has chosen D. Someone chosen from B and it becomes D. All right, good. Any other thoughts? We'll move on. Hmm. Someone actually mentions Wellen. 
Good. All right. I'm going to mention D, none of the above as well. I'm probably going to move on in the interest of time. All right. This is the ECG after that. The first ECG was just now what I showed to you. This is a subsequent ECG. I think without doubt, everyone will agree. The anterior lead starts to have a bit of ST elevation and it's not a smiley face. It's a frowning smiley. It's a frowning face looking at you over here. So this patient definitely has transited into a myocardial infarction. So what you were looking at just now, you know, was really a case of Wellen syndrome. You're very right. And the Wellen syndrome is an indication of a critical the, uh, lesion in the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. So in this patient, he was unlucky. He transited into an MI very fast enough. So therefore, you know, what would you do now? You only have three choices. And I just believe that everyone will definitely, out of these three choices, you will definitely come with the same answer. Because when you have that, this ECG, your choices are only left with these three. One, it's an AMI. You need to refer for primary PCI, all right? Two, it's still an AMI. You need to refer for primary PCI. And three, it's definitely an AMI. You need to do a primary PCI. Otherwise, patient probably will succumb, all right? So primary PCI in the MI case, it's the gold standard of management, all right? All right, now let's move on. So what is Wellens syndrome? There's actually two types, type A and type B. So basically, it is in type A is the less common one where you see a biphasic T wave. Your T wave goes up and then come down. So this is what we call Wellen type A. Wellen type B, the one where we see in our patient, deep T wave inversion in the anterior leads, more common type, indicative of a critical lesion at the proximal LED. Time to the full-blown MI is only in terms of about a week. The risk of MI, if you don't do anything urgently enough, is 75% risk of MI. In this patient, he definitely has it 100% already. So the next time when you see Wellen syndrome, or sometimes we call it the LAD coronary T-wave syndrome, where you have either type A or type B, ST changes are almost none to be seen. Your R wave progression from V1, the R wave to V6 is still intact. Think of Wellen syndrome, call up your friendly cardiologist in Thompson Hospital. Just kidding. <laughs> then you need to get to your cardiologist colleague very soon enough because this patient may go into an MI in that context. All right. And this patient was the angiogram of a very tight lesion, almost 99% stenosis. We open it up and his life is safe and he does not need to suffer a sudden cardiac death because of an AMI in that context. So with that, coming to the very last case of my discussion today, case number six, fast and furious. So I have this 46 years old lady, you know, diabetes, recurrent palpitation with some chest discomfort, crop T borderlines raised, vital stable. This is the ECG of the patient on admission. Have a look at this ECG, it's bizarre looking. All right, I agree with you, but do not be you know, overwhelmed with it. Just look at it very closely and let me know what do you think of this ECG at the end of the day. Do you think this ECG is an intermittent left bundle branch block, non-STEMI, sinus rhythm with PVC or intermittent pre-excitation, A, B, C, and D. I'm going to bring back the ECG for you to have a look and tell me your answer in that context. So is this sinus rhythm with PVC or is this n STEMI or is it just a left bundle branch block ECG intermittently? One bit normal, one bit going to bundle branch block. Hmm, I see some interesting answer here. Some thinking is pre-excitation. Some thinking is PVC with sinus rhythm and some things is non STEMI. All right. Okay, let's move on. So let's have a look at this ECG over here. I'm just going to zoom in. We see something broadish over here as opposed to something that is narrowish. So this is definitely a QRS that is broad. But what is very different from this QRS that is broad is over here, all right, compared to the narrow one. If you can see, the narrow one, they have a P, then there's a bit of PR interval, then there's a QRS. But when it's a broad one, you basically see the P is just right at the foot heel of the QRS, it's so close together. The PR interval is so short. And when something that is so short, what do you think? A short PR interval that looks like this, 
it always tells you in this context of today's talk, it is a pre-excited ECG. So intermittently, the patient go into pre-excitation. All right. Pre-excitation, what does it mean? It means patient had an accessory pathway in the heart. Intermittently, the SA node signals comes down through AV node, comes down to the histopathology system. Intermittently, it will go from the SA node, goes through the accessory pathway, go down to the ventricle. So that's why you get a bizarre looking QRS with a short PR interval over here. But the story doesn't stop there. Suddenly in ED, she developed this very fast heart rhythm looking like this. So this one, what happened over here? Something very different from what we are seeing just now. You know, uh, with something broadish. Everything now is very narrow, complex tachycardia over here. So my question to you is very simple. SVT, yes or no? A or B? What's your thought? I hope no one thinks it's sinus tachycardia. <laughs> All right, great. Yes, this is SVT. Thank you very much for the uh, response. This is clearly a, a clear-cut ECG of an SVT. So someone with accessory pathway, they can go into SVT. And accessory pathway, SVT can be different types. All right. Remember, I was telling you that when your P appears before the T, it's always SVT until proven otherwise. And this is exactly what happened to this patient. The P is very sharp. After that, followed by the inverted T wave here. So it tells you this is really SVT until proven otherwise. So what happened is in someone with accessory pathway, we do realize that there are times they can actually develop what we call a form of narrow complex tachycardia. And narrow complex tachycardia is known as autodromic re-entrant tachycardia. If it's a broad complex tachycardia, we call it antidromic. So it's just depending on how the circuit goes. If the circuit goes like this, that means from the atrium goes down through the AV node, goes to his Purkinje, then come up through the accessory pathway, anything that goes down through the his Purkinje, you get a narrow complex SVT. If it's the other way around, it goes down through accessory, goes through the myocardial conduction, and it only go up to his Purkinje, then you get a broad complex. So it depends on which way it's going. You will get either a narrow one or you get a broadish one. But nevertheless, it's fast and it's utilizing the accessory pathway. Treatment for this is very simple. If patient wants a potential cure, then we actually ablate away this pathway. Once you ablate away this pathway, the pathway is gone. There's no more circuit for short circuit to happen. Patient will not get an AVRT or SVT in that context. That is why in this kind of patient, we should send them for electrophysiology study. We put wires in like this and girls like it a lot because it's a platinum catheter. So it's very expensive catheters. One of it can cost a lot. It allows us to through the, see the intracardiac signals that we see here. So EPs are not just only looking at lines. We actually look very colorful lines as well. These are intracardiac electrograms that we see because we put the catheters inside the heart chamber. And once we get a very good spot, we can actually go and ablate it using a radio frequency or what we call the fire method. We burn away the abnormal spot, the abnormal circuit, and they are cured for life with good success rate with less or low risk of recurrence itself. Sometimes now people also advocate ablation using the ice method. You know, we actually have this using liquid nitrogen that can bring in and freeze the cells down to negative 40 to negative 55 degrees Celsius. So having said that, if you have an SVT patient, uh, ablation is potentially curative and it solves the patient problems once and for all without the need to be on lifelong medication, which is just at best suppressive. So with that, allow me to share with you the last slide here. The take-home messages over here is ECG leads position can change for various purposes. If you need it, for instance, a posterior MI, you have to probably do a posterior lead ECG itself. And of course, ST elevations are crucial to recognize and decide on the etiology. Most of the time, ST elevation is always think of MI, but there are times it may not be MI. It can be turned out to be a benign early repolarization. Of course, variation of heart rate and rhythm can be physiological like sinus arrhythmia. But always, if you have any doubts, you know, seek your second opinion. And of course, the next time when you see a normal ECG, 
and patient having a very weird symptoms of presentation, always think of QT intervals. Measure it, eyeball it, then you probably are dealing with a long QT syndrome. And anytime a maternal case comes to you with palpitation, don't brush them off as sinus tachycardia. Look very hard at the P to QRS relationship, P to T wave relationship. And if at any doubts, you know, treat it as an SVT until proven otherwise. And SVT is potentially curable. Diagnose it, refer it appropriately, ablate it. Patient will really thank you because they are safe of this problem for the rest of their life. But if all of this confuse you or you simply cannot remember anything from today or you are in dumps or need clarification or you need first, second, third opinion, always fret not. Just remember this email here. With that, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll be very glad to take any questions if there are any. If there's any afterthoughts which you have not think of now, always feel free to drop me a line at epthompson at hotmail.com. Otherwise, once again, a big shout out again to IMU alumni and also Dr. Sandeep and team and Nabila as well as also Cindy for the kind invite for today's talk. Back to you, Cindy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Gary, for the very informative session today. Um, now, I would like to open the session for Q&A. So if you have any question, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Or if you're shy, you can just type uh, your question in the chat box. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But we still can hear our voices without seeing your uh, video, so you shouldn't <laughs> yes, be feeling yes. shy. Yeah, <laughs> so don't be shy. Uh, I, we, I'm i sure uh, Dr. Gary doesn't buy if we ask him <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so we open the question now. Yeah. I, I get a lot of thank you. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the kind uh, words. Yeah. All right. It's always a pleasure to be able to share e ECGs and uh, it's even better if we can do it physically, then that will be more interactive. Yes. Uh, I true, have to agree true. with that. Yeah. So mm. I, I think there are probably no questions either because of one, probably I'm a good teacher. <laughs> Second, oh, or else people will probably do There's one already. question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one question. There's, All right. <laughs> yeah. There's a question from uh ah, how do you diff Yong. yes, correct. Yes. How do you differentiate between PVCs and intermittent pre-excitation? That's a very valid question. All right. If you look back at the ECG just now, if I may, just going to bring you back to the ECG that was uh, making everyone puzzle a bit. Uh, just give me a bit of time to bring up the ECG again. Okay, I'm back here. I'm going to share the screen again. All right. So if you have a look at here, right, if it's really a PVC, all right, you should not see a relation or an association between P and QRS. But over here, you see the P and the QRS. The P and the QRS is constantly together. In EP, in electrocardiogram, there's nothing such as consistent incidental finding like this. So when it's something that is consistently happening like this, it happens for a reason because this is a sinus P conducting down through the accessory pathway. So that's why it's a pre-excitation. A PVC will look exactly bizarre looking like a pre-excited QRS. There's no way you say the QRS is a bit fatter than that's PVC. It's a bit slimmer, that is a uh, accessory pathway. But the association between the P and the QRS, that's your key point to help you differentiate between a pre-excitation or is this really a PVC by itself? All right. And you can see also over here, this is probably a very nice uh, to look at. The P wave is very sharp pointy. The T wave is a bit roundish. All right. That's because one is depolarization wave. One is uh, repolarization. Re repolarization, the action potential is a bit slower. That's why it's a bit curvy. All right. So hopefully I'll be able to answer, I have answered that question of yours. Yeah, thank you for the question and also the explanation, Dr. Gary. So, any more questions? Do you have a question, Dr. Sandeep? Oh, we have. Uh, no, yeah. I, I don't have a question. But I just want to thank uh, <laughs> okay. Dr. Gary for, yeah. his, uh, for his time this afternoon, uh, sharing his yes, uh, passion, yes. his ECG passions with, with, with us. Uh, <laughs> of course, it's always nice to have an alumni to talk to us again. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're waiting for other questions. Any more questions? Every anyone? If there's no question, we can end our talk for today. So yes, and don't forget to um, give your feedback on the talk for today. It will be um, grateful so that we know and do let us know what kind of topic that you, you interest you the most so that the next talk we know we can invite someone that um, the topic that you um, suggest. Oh, um, Theodore said that he enjoyed the case number four. Oh, yes. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy sharing as much as I enjoy listening to it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, sure. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have yeah. a good weekend uh, ahead. Yeah, so I guess that's all for today. All right, uh, once again, thank you everyone um, to all the participants, Dr. Gary for today's session. Of course, um, Dr. Ao uh, and Dr. Sandeep um, for attending the talk as well. So uh, don't forget to scan the QR code and give us your feedback. Um, so I guess there's no more questions uh, from everyone. So we can end the session um, today. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Thank you okay, so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.